there in the back. I can hear you whispering. Look, the doubt. Look, doubting tongues. Well, you know what? It's really not fair. You didn't name any of the other disciples in that way. You didn't say, look, abandoning Peter. You didn't even say, look, betraying Judas. For that matter, why couldn't you just name me the name that the gospel gives me, Thomas, the twin? Or maybe even brave Thomas. After all, when all the other disciples were whining, ooh, if we go back to Judea, we'll get stoned to death. Poor us. When they were saying that, I responded, well, then we'll go to Judea and we'll die with Jesus. Or you can call me inquisitive, Thomas. After all, there was the one, that one time when Jesus told us that he was going someplace. And he, we already, he claimed we already knew where that place was. Truth be told, I think uh, Jesus sometimes gave us a little more credit than was due to us disciples. Well, everyone else just nodded solemnly as if they knew what Jesus was talking about. Not me, though. I am inquisitive, Thomas, and I asked, I wanted to make sure I actually knew what he was talking about. So I asked, I chose to ask the dumb question. The question nobody else is willing to ask, where are you talking about? But no, I'm stuck with the name Doubting Tongue. Let us pray. Lord God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Lord God, may the preacher decrease that you might increase. Amen. <clears throat> Doubting tongue. All because of one incident. And he died for crying out loud. We'd all seen it. Our Lord hung there on a cross like a criminal. And then, later, Mary told us he'd risen from the dead. And we didn't believe her. None of us believed her. Not one of us believed Mary when she told us this thing. We all doubted. Not just me, all the disciples. We could be the doubting disciples. But no, just me. That's why the other disciples locked themselves up in the upper room. They didn't trust that if Jesus could come to Mary, he could come to all of us. Yet I'm, again, the one with the bad rap. But I, I at least went outside. I wasn't afraid to die. We all doubted, but I wasn't afraid to die. I didn't lock myself in the room out of fear, though we may all have doubted. We may have all doubted, but I figured that if they killed me for knowing Jesus, then so be it. But I'm the doubter. I wasn't in the room that first time. So you know, I really missed out. You see, next time I saw them, the other disciples, they were, they were changed. They told me about being breathed on, how that changed everything. And I'll be frank, that seemed kind of strange, if not disgusting to me. Being breathed on by a dead guy? Think of the haliotosis alone. But I couldn't knock it. It gave them peace. It changed them from frightened fishermen hiding out to bold preachers front and center. I was jealous of that. Maybe that would have been a better name for me. Jealous Thomas. You see, I'd cop to that. I am. I was jealous. 
jealous of their new status and jealous of their boldness. After all, I was always the bold one. But after seeing them, I felt like the person who misread the worship time and got to Easter an hour late and only had time to pick up lilies and go back home without even hearing the good news, the gospel. I felt as if I had missed Easter. And I couldn't believe them. I couldn't believe they'd seen him. I couldn't believe the transformation that had come over them. I couldn't believe. Well, I couldn't. I couldn't believe, but ultimately wasn't wasn't any of the stuff you think. It was I couldn't believe that I'd missed it. I missed Jesus coming back. I'd missed this peace that they all felt, I felt left out. And therefore I was jealous of them and I went so far as to cut myself off from that community. Because I could not, I could not trust their words. But that right there is another thing you need to get straight. I wasn't doubting Jesus, never him, I wasn't doubting a God, never God. I was doubting their words, the fellow disciples' words. I just, just missed his return. I missed out on what they had seen that and felt and experienced that, that change moment they all had after Easter. I missed that. And you know, it didn't help the way they were acting. They were all so excited about this forgiving and retaining sins thing. In fact, they tried it out on me more than once. And I'm sure they meant well, but it felt as if they believed doubt was a sin. Do you know what it feels like to have your brothers and sisters whisper and even say aloud, that you are a sinner because you doubt? A sinner because you weren't there in the room? A sinner because you missed out? A sinner because they were all certain and your uncertainty made them feel uncomfortable? Do you know what that's like? What can I say? They, they were changed and I missed it. They were gung ho and I was still in the depths of despair. It made me pull away from them, even though they were trying their best to continue to be my brother. They went so far as to call me a sinner for missing that moment, for doubting, for being who I am, or at least who you all say I am, doubting Thomas. And because of all that, I blew up and I blew it. I said something I didn't really mean. I said I would only believe if I could switch my fingers around in his womb. Which is pretty gross stuff, if you stop and think about it. It's macabre even. But truly, I was in despair. While everyone else had experienced resurrection, I was still despairing. Not doubting but despairing. Despairing Thomas, not doubting Thomas. That one, that one works too. Somehow, somehow I toughed it through though. I came back despite all that and I showed back up in that room with them the next week. There with them. A voice came from behind us. Behind me. And it said, peace be with you. Peace be with you. And you know what? He, Jesus, the one behind me, took my gross little challenge, the one that I'd thrown in the face of my brothers, and I suppose ultimately, in a 
face of God? That challenge of poking my fingers in his wounds? And made it a redeemable moment. A place from which I too could believe. A place beyond my despair. And I shouted out, My Lord and my God. And that's when things get complicated. Most people think that Jesus' response to me was another rebuke. That Jesus too was calling me a sinner for not being with them with other disciples, for being Doubting Thomas, that Jesus too forsook me as Doubting Thomas, just as you all have done for centuries and centuries, for two millennia. But it wasn't a rebuke, brothers and sisters. He just asked me a rhetorical set question. Have you believed because you have seen? Then here's the cool thing. He looked past me through the room, out into eternity, to future generations, to all of you. And he blessed them. They ble he blessed you, saying, Blessed are those who have not seen and have yet come to believe. It wasn't a rebuke. It was a blessing. A blessing for all those Christians who came after us. He was promising them, promising you, Promising you all his love and his faithfulness, his resurrection, his peace, his forgiveness, his gospel for them, for you. It wasn't about me, about my doubting, but about his blessings, Christ's blessings that conquer the grave and conquer our despair and our division and continue to bring life to this very day. In this very moment, in the words that are spoken from my lips, that blessing is coming out. So please understand, if I am doubting Thomas, and perhaps I am, if I am doubting Thomas, though, you are blessed disciple. You are blessed Christian. You are blessed children of the living God. Amen. And hallelujah.